Welcome back. Today, I'm meeting with combat veteran and author, Justin Watson, and we're going to discuss the Russo-Ukrainian War. The purpose of this podcast is twofold. The first is I'm going to provide a fairly comprehensive update on the Russo-Ukrainian War, up to including events that have occurred since July 19th. Secondly, and even more importantly, Justin Watson, who is a former field artillery officer in the United States Army, is going to provide a comprehensive overview of the HIMARS artillery weapons platform. And we're going to answer the question that everybody has. Is this going to be the silver bullet for the Ukrainians in halting the Russian advance? Or is it just another technical solution that can be circumvented by other means? Well, sit down, buckle up, and be prepared to peer through a glass darkly. I'm here with Justin Watson. Justin, how are you doing, my friend? Hi, Sean. I am doing good this evening. I'm uh, sorry for the witness protection lighting. I'm uh, joining you from a hotel in Oklahoma City tonight. I hope you're not planning a bombing. Uh, I'm not that far right wing. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just, I'm just, that, that I'm was, very, I was like, uh, that was in really bad taste. It was, anyway. it was in poor taste, but I'm going to go with it anyway. I will say I've never even glanced at the Turner Diaries. So I think we're all right. Okay. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about what is one of my perennial topics, which is the Ukraine-Russia war. I want to emphasize that it's not a good thing. People are suffering. I just haven't put out a video in a while on this. And frankly, the media has been ignoring it, which tends to lead one to kind of know how it's been going. So I'm just going to do a very broad update on where the conflict stands today. And then we're going to get into the HIMARS artillery systems. And Justin is a relevant guest because he was a field artillery officer in the U.S. Army for 10 years? Yes, sir. 10 years. Okay. So he's going to be able to break down exactly what advantages and disadvantages the system confers to the Ukrainians. All right. So where we are today, the Russians have effectively taken over all of Luhansk province. They are working their way through Donetsk. They are positioning north of the border in Belarus. They've been reinforcing that border for a few weeks now, which is concerning. In turn, the Ukrainians are mining that border. There's a blockade in the Black Sea, as well as Ukrainian mines. Approximately 20% of Ukrainian grain elevators have been damaged. There's also about 20 million tons of grain from the last season that hasn't been shipped yet. If you take all the rivers, roads, and rail, the Ukrainians at best can ship 2 million tons of that to the West. So we're in a flashing red crisis come the fall. The other issue that is worth mentioning is that Ukraine produces 10% of the world's green. Again, not, not, not great. So a lot of that, if that doesn't get into, into the world, you're going to have some issues in the Middle East that I've talked about on prior show, Middle East and Africa, and then continued food inflation in the United States. Again, not great. Probably good for the Republicans from a domestic political standpoint, just because it'll influence the outcome of the, the midterms. And again, that's not a partisan comment. It's just reality. It's not going to be great. The there was also are the worst they are for the incumbent. It's natural order of things. Particularly on the economy. And this, you know, a lot of this, there are discrete policies like the second stimulus bill that actively pushed you know, or caused inflation, but that's not the only cause. There's the activity of the Fed and certainly the, the war in Ukraine is, is part of that. It's, again, it's not a simple thing. I also briefly checked out 
the Wall Street Journal today to, to get an update on some of this. And I learned that John Kirby is now the national security advisor. He's not. But according to the Wall Street Journal, he he was. He's the White House <laughs> national security advisor. Anyway. And the other thing, too, is the production of grain is expected to be down by a third of what it traditionally is in Ukraine. So they're trying to come up with a bunch of solutions, but it's very likely to be ugly. At the same time, the second Moscow Mechanism report came out by the OSCE. Don't ask me what that stands for, but it details the atrocities on both sides. So the Ukrainians have been doing bad stuff too. Um, the most common is obviously showing the faces of prisoners and coercing them to speak on camera. Both sides Which do is that. a no no by the law of war. Yeah. Which but yeah, both sides have been doing that routinely. Yeah. So between April 1st and June 25th, the period that was covered, there's been 124 reported cases of sexual violence against Ukrainians, 97 against women, the balance against men, and the age of alleged, and these are alleged incidents, right? But the age of alleged uh, rapes start from nine months old, a nine month old boy to 78 years old. So the Russians are continuing with their historical tradition of raping everything inside. I shouldn't say that, but, you know, it's, it's not every Russian is doing this, but it's a pattern of behavior that's difficult to ignore. It is unfortunate in the extreme. And any historian who's at all familiar with the Eastern Front knows how ludicrously common. And to be clear, not to cut the Nazis any slack, it was ludicrously common for Germans to do the same to Slavic peoples as they went through. It just so happens that Russia was able to do so to a utterly defenseless Germany at that point. I'm not claiming moral superiority for the Nazis in this. I'm just saying that while sexual assault and rape are forms of indiscipline that are tragically ubiquitous for warfare, they are not usually conducted on the scale that you would see in the modern era, that you would see the Russians on the Eastern Front, the Japanese in China, and perhaps now the Russians in Ukraine. One thing you kind of already, you pointed out when you said alleged, one thing to keep in mind about this, while I'm firmly, I'll admit my partisan bias, I hope Ukraine defeats the Russian invasion. I hope Ukraine survives as a sovereign state in reality mm -hmm. as well as in name. There are a lot of things being reported that are being labeled war crimes. Obviously, sexual assault and rape are war crimes. But every time they mention a bombardment or a missile strike and paint it as a war crime, I would take that as with a huge grain of salt because the rules on collateral damage are extremely subjective. The proportionality and military benefit have to be by a reasonable per person standard proportional to the human suffering. And the, who, who decides that? Well, the tribunal, I guess, if you ever convene one. I, I went through, as you probably did during ROTC at West Point, you go through semesters of law of war training, and there was never a brigade commander is worth killing 50 civilians. There was never a chart, you know, of what target you could hit and how many civilians could die. Yeah, it's just it. don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Which is easier so, said than done, right? Yeah. If you have lawyers well, writing the Jiva Convention, you're they're not practical. They're very hard to abide by. But yeah. but that's not really what we abide by, right? We accept collateral damage for certain targets, even America, even we who well, that, that's a can of worms. I'll, I'll push that aside for a minute. Yeah. Even we who in consider ourselves morally bound, even in the midst of war, even we will admit okay, this person is worth risking the deaths of non-combatants because their threat is such that we think we will save more non-combatant lives. Even we perform that calculus and obviously the Russians are going to, they're going to be more cold-blooded in their calculations, but that doesn't necessarily mean every missile that hits a city is a war crime because it, it may not be. It's unpleasant, but it's not necessarily a war crime. Now, Raping a nine-month-old? Yeah, that's clearly a war crime. That person needs to hang. So I, I just, 
keep in mind, we're not going to know the truth of this until perhaps years after the war, because both sides, and again, I am on Ukraine's side, I want them to win, both sides have very clear motivations to lie about mm-hmm. what's happening. Well, and the other thing, too, is I completely buried the lead. So yeah. two days ago, so this is right, today is the 19th of July. So on the 17th, the head of the British Armed Forces reported or, or said that their estimate is that there have been 50,000 Russian killed or wounded in the conflict thus far, including, and then 1,700 tanks destroyed. So those aren't Ukrainian numbers. Those are British military Third party intelligence. Verified, yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, or mil- whatever, whatever the, the Ministry of Defense, I guess is what they're called. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you remember uh, how many went in, I think it was like 135,000, something like that. I don't remember the raw numbers for the initial invasion. So you're talking a you third. Know, not quite it. Yeah, you're yeah, you're about a little over a third at this point. So yeah. that is that is devastating. There have been other reports too that there uh with the Wagner group is visiting prisons and the Russians are giving them amnesty if they sign up for these military contracts. Offline. Prior guest, Sean McFate, who is a professor at the Atlantic Council and the National Defense University. He's an expert on mercenaries. He also wrote New Rules for War. A few months ago, what he was saying is that in the Donbass, they were starting to use Wagner for non-traditional Wagner missions, which is kind of these World War I style feed the meat grinder operations. So they're lowering their recruiting standards. And again, I just it was confirmed in the news recently where they were at a prison and they were just putting these kind of sending these conscripts over. The other thing that's kind of interesting, and this is going to lead to our discussion about high noise is there's also, well, there was a, again, I don't, uh, I don't know how good the source is, but apparently there was a, a higher level Russian tank leader or you know, commander of a, a tank unit that killed himself because they were starting to get these reserve tanks. And anecdotally, what some of these Russian sources are saying on Telegram is that of every four tanks that they receive, about three of them have problems. Like some of them like literally don't have engines. (laughs) Really, really, really crazy, insane kind of stuff that you sort of stuff you would expect from uh, a Shoigu led Russian military industrial complex. And this is so this and they started breaking out the T55s yet or are they back to back that far are they still on T72s and T64s i think they're down point? to T62s at this point oh wow some T mostly T64s but i think they're starting to break into the T62s but the russians so, never throw anything away yeah but it's even when they it's should not, it's not it's not looking great so the the head of ukrainian military intelligence so take it with a grain of salt claims that the breaking point will be in the second week of August with all the logistics. Now, this is what's relevant. I keep saying there's something that's relevant to artillery. So right now in the Donbass region, the Russians are firing an average of 20,000 shells a day, 20,000. The Ukrainians can't keep up. The best they can do is about 6,000 shells a day. So that said, same sort of logistical report on Telegram is that the Russian artillerymen, which is basically the Russian way of war. They don't have artillery, they die. Mm -hmm. There's, I think the the estimate that they're talking about is about two thirds of their barrels are no bueno. And when those things fail, and I'm going to let you talk a little bit more about this because, you know, the best they can do, the best they can do is like banana peel, right? Just banana. The worst, I mean... What the happens worst is a crew up- gone. Yeah. The worst is an entire artillery crew evaporated. And depending on whether they were positioning properly, if they're using manual methods of laying their guns, using an aiming circle or the Russian equivalent of an aiming circle and calling out verbal commands, which they may very well be, because a lot of those digital systems degrade, even if you're really used to using them and you're well-practiced with them, like we traditionally have been, for the last couple of generations, you you still end up using manual methods from time to time. Then your your artillery pieces are usually positioned a little closer 
than they might be if you're shooting via digital communications or even over FM comms, radio communications. So that means one, even one barrel catastrophically failing might put two or three or four howitzers out of commission, theoretically speaking. Uh, and it is a huge, it is a serious issue. So in the American army, this is all unclassified. I'm not revealing anything secret. We keep logs of every round at what propellant charge because our artillery pieces all have variable propellant charge. You know, a tank round is a tank round. You're loading a fully fixed piece of ammunition into the breach of your M1 Abram, M1A2 Abrams. And in an artillery piece, you're setting the charge behind the projectile each time you fire. So you have to log not only what projectile you're firing, what charge you're firing it at, and what lot of charge you were using. I know, I think uh, tank units uh, track ammunition lots as well. But oh, yeah. we do, we, we track what are called EFCs, equivalent full charges. And at a certain point, you reach a certain number, you retire that barrel and you replace it before something can happen is the whole point. So it does not shock me that <laughs> the Russian artillery may not have been as meticulous in their log keeping for their barrels. Now, now they're experiencing problems with that. And it is, you're right, it is a huge issue because the Russian uh, philosophy of artillery, and it is not a bad philosophy, mind you, has always been mass. Lots of it. Russians traditionally don't do things like account for weather conditions when they're shooting artillery. We do. We, we apply meteorological data. Their attitude is we're firing enough. What about, what about for chemical munitions? So when we trained as Russians, we would mm -hmm. certainly account for meteorological data. Sure. But I don't know, I don't know about the actual Russians. Did they do the same thing or no? Uh, I do not know about chemical. I don't know about chemical. I imagine you would have to, given the, the uniqueness of chemical weaponry and how easily it disperses or doesn't based on wind conditions and humidity. Yeah, or and blows back into your face. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So in that case, they would have to. But I'm I'm speaking largely for either high explosive or normal smoke or things of that nature, just to not to calculate the dispersal of smoke or chemical effects, but to calculate the point of impact. American artillery applies air pressure, wind speed, all, like I said, all meteorological data just when, for calculating the point of impact of a high explosive round on the ground. The it's, Russians, almost like the, it's almost like the crosswind sensor on an M1, right? It's just exactly. more sophisticated on the artillery side because yeah, well, bigger because boom, bigger damage. Bigger boom, bigger damage, and it's traveling through both a larger vertical chunk of space and a larger uh, larger vertical. It's late here, sorry. A larger vertical chunk of space and a larger horizontal chunk of space. So it is more affected by the winds at various elevations, mm -hmm. or I should say altitudes, than a, a tank round would be. Although obviously tanks can shoot five k five kilometers yeah, out. It's still matters. Well, yeah, plus, you're going to have a greater gra like temperature gradient, air pressure, mm -hmm. and things like that that's going to mess with the all, round. All that to say, in Russian doctrine, at, at the last I was briefed, that wasn't a thing. You know, <laughs> they didn't they didn't take into account the wind speed velocity at various altitudes along the the flight of the ballistic path of a high explosive round. They don't do that. Their attitude is, we're going to hit that with three battalions of artillery. Enough will get close. That has generally been their philosophy. Our philosophy has generally been to have more accurate, more mobile, smaller units of artillery. And from what I can see, and I, I acknowledge that everything we're seeing is, forgive me the pun, through a glass darkly in a ongoing war zone. Everything I'm seeing is the Ukrainians are by necessity having to adopt our philosophy by virtue of having our equipment and by virtue of being outnumbered as they're having to be more clever and more agile than they are overwhelming in the amount of fire they can place. Well, you actually raised a great point too, which is most of the original Ukrainian equipment was for 152 millimeter howitzers, right? Or not mm -hmm. howitzers, but whatever the, yeah, whatever yeah. No, the that, that's is. a correct, perfectly correct term. Okay, whereas ours are 155. You know, mm -hmm. We're not talking about high Mars at this point, but yeah. in terms of like just the old traditional yeah. guns, artillery guns. I don't know how many, but I know we have given them to the triple seven towed 155 yeah. as well now. So the, the problem with towed artillery 
obviously has its place in the battlefield. You can sling man it under a helicopter, which is great. I don't know how much of that the Ukrainians are doing because they don't have a permissive air environment the way we normally do. But the issue, the only issue with towed artillery is not being self-propelled inevitably makes it a longer, longer interval to shoot and scoot. Because you've got to hook that, you've got to unass the artillery piece, you know, pull up, pull up the trails, you know, the trunnions that you see coming off the back of a cannon that's towed. You've got to get those up off the ground reorient the, the gun to where it's in a travel position and then hook it to a vehicle and then move. And then you have to repeat the process at your new firing point. And we're dealing with a situation where both sides have counterfire radar. That's something that not enough mm. people are talking about because I, in preparation for this video, I did try to do some research as well. I know the Ukrainians have some of our counterfire radars and they're using but, them. But that's only recent though, right? Like that's within yeah. the last few months. Within because the last few, yeah. yeah, last few weeks they have at least one AN-36, which is a good solid counterfire radar, as long as they're trained to use it properly. That's that's a big caveat on all of this: is have their operators been trained properly, and can they maintain the equipment? Because all of this stuff that we use breaks rather easily if you're not doing preventative maintenance on it, and it's kind of hard to fix if you're not familiar with it. So, but I also don't know, the Russians do have counterfire radar, obviously. I don't know how effective their radar batteries have been. And I was unable to find anything to that nature. From what I can see, you know, kind of extrapolating from the reporting I see, it doesn't seem like they're very effective because the Ukrainian artillery is still operational and fighting back. But I know for artillerymen, and again, in our doctrine, counter battery destroying the enemy's artillery is kind of the first born mission of the artillery. Because as much as we want to support our maneuver brethren, more than that, we want to make sure that you're not subject to their artillery while you're right. accomplishing your mission. So, yeah, Air Force, Air Force does the same sort of thing. I yeah. had a friend who was a mm -hmm. former stealth bomber pilot talk about all that he's just like we'd have air superiority in the first afternoon or the first week is kind of what he said he was yeah. surprised that the russians did not figure out how to do that which is crazy oh, the other thing i forgot i forgot to mention is i think the ukrainians have re-seized about a thousand towns and villages that have been captured to date and then i think there's around something on the order of 25 to 2600 towns that are still under Russian control, which is which is not great. It feels like I think the Ukrainians are gearing up for an offensive in the south in Kyrgyzstan, which the Russians I think are having a, a little bit of a, a, a devil of planning. And then I saw like this is the weirdest article. I don't I don't know exactly where I saw it, but I saw it sometime today. The Russians control the Z Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, and there was a report of. Russian soldiers screaming and running out of the plant again, away from some unknown stimulus. So I, I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I it's, it's a mystery. Good. <laughs> I would guess Ukrainian special forces, but it was on UFO Twitter. So you, you figure that out. <laughs> you figure that one out. It could be either. I, I, These are strange times we live in. Yeah, I would think it's I would think it's something more a little bit more terrestrial. And then I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Oh, yeah, yeah, again, I missed something very big. So Gazprom recently cut off or cut down the output of the Nord Stream 1 pipeline mm -hmm. uh, by 60%. So it's down to 40% for repairs. And of course, Germany was completely flat-footed in the response to that. So they, they're, they're starting to dig into their reserves, et cetera. But anybody with half a brain saw it in 2011 when Angela Merkel, or uh, is that right? That's not her name right. <laughs> Angela yeah. Merkel, 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 might as well be Merkel. Angela Merkel, you know, announced that they were going to close down their nuclear power plants in the wake of the Fukushima disaster so uh, just stupid stupid and i think trump inexcusable, inexcusable. yeah and I, and I think trump like a few years back in maybe 2017 or 2018 spoke at the un and was talking about 
Exactly, exactly this scenario. And the Germans were just laughing at him. It's like, ha, 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 you're funny. Yeah, ha, yeah, never happened. And then it's just like, yeah, well, guess where you are? Guess we are today. Is it, and, and like, it, no surprise to anyone. So, and then the last piece, and this actually is directly relevant for both of us because we both have YouTube channels. Apparently, Google had to pay a 373 million dollar fine to Russia. Now that's whatever the ruble equivalent was um, because depending on the news source, you'll see a different number based on the exchange rate. But the fine was primarily because of YouTube and the Russians (laughs) wanted them to remove all of the fake news and information on YouTube. So thank you, YouTube, for not canceling my channel and removing my commentary on this whole situation, because I I am indeed the Putin whisperer, and I can basically <laughs> predict what, what he's going to do. Speaking of which, it sounds like they're going to be doing an expansion of their, to their military operation. So in my opinion, there's kind of been three phases to this war. There's been the kind of quick victory sort of Operation Cobra 2-like scenario where they just go into key. And by the way, for listeners who don't know what Cobra 2 is, Cobra was the race to reach the the fillets or fillet gap. Close the fillets pocket, yeah. Fillets, I don't know how to pronounce it. I don't speak French. Yep, yep, so yep. fillets pocket in World War II. Mm-hmm. Operation Cobra 2 was the invasion of Iraq in 2003. So colloquially known as the Thunder Run. Is, is what you probably, our viewers have probably heard that term. The, the Thunder Run's actual operational name was Cobra 2. Which is, which is the, I think it's the final phase of that when they just sent in a unit into downtown Baghdad and they did the th- Thunder Run. I think that's what Putin's military was likely mon- uh, basing this. So it's General Kurosimov who came up with this whole mm-hmm. new fandangled military strategy. And now he's, where is he? <laughs> kind of disappeared after the uh, before the victory day so uh mm-hmm. he's somewhere so thank you youtube for not removing my channel because putin doesn't like it uh, i appreciate that <laughs> okay so all of that the past is prologue how does high mars like what is high mars how does it work why is it is it going to be you know, the, the new thing, or is it just, there's not, not enough systems to make a decisive difference in the, in the short term. Oh, and by the way, I forgot one thing. Putin just recently is either visiting or just visited or came back from Iran, Tehran. Uh, and one of the things that he's going to try to secure are some of these Iranian drones, which again, could be bad for the high Mars thing. So anyway, with that, yeah. go. Yeah, no, that, that could be bad for high Mars. So briefly as I can, the United States Army field artillery is broken broadly into cannon units and rocket units. The rocket units are either high Mars, which is what we're talking about today, or MLRS. Now, MLRS will be familiar to folks who watch any coverage of the Gulf War. It's the big tracked vehicle with the box that opens up, rotates, and shoots what looks like 5 million rockets. Out of the and and what, do, what, do high, what do high Mars and MLRS stand for? Like what, what? High mobility artillery rockets. I'm, I'm bullshitting you. It's so right. MLRS is multiple launch rocket system. High Mars is, because I'm not going to bullcrap you. I know it's high yeah, mobility, we'll right. but I want to make sure I've got the actual, the actual terminology right. So here we go. I mean, I would guess high mobility, high mobility artillery, artillery rocket, rocket system. system. I, I shouldn't doubt myself. I know these things. See, so I don't even the, know what it is, and I just made it up, and I was right. So yeah, yeah, yeah no one's that. That one's actually logical. That I didn't. I didn't want the army to throw me a curveball and have someone get me in the comments. So high mobility <laughs> artillery rocket system. So basically, a high Mars is if you take one of those MLRS tracked vehicles, cut the rocket or missile capacity in half because the that box has two pods worth of rockets or one missile in each pod. You have one pod and it's on a truck system instead. Basically the same truck we use for large scale logistics, the same chassis we use for our fuelers, 
It's the same basic truck oh, with a so it's, so it's, it's, a, it's so it's a Hemet. It's it's on a Hemet. Yes. Okay. All right. No, I used to I used to I yeah, was as any, any tracked vehicle, any tracked vehicle unit you're familiar with your Hemets rolling up to bring you beans, bullets, fuel. Yeah. That's and Hemet is H E M M T. It's yes. been a while, something like that. Yeah. I don't know what it stands for, and we don't care. Um, yeah, we don't care. So basically, the, there are advantages and disadvantages you get with that. You have lower capacity per vehicle, but each vehicle is less maintenance because you don't have a track system. Wheel vehicles tend to be less maintenance than tracks. It's probably one of the reasons we didn't give MLRS to Ukraine. We gave HIMARS to them instead. It's a newer system, so most of these are more up to date than our what MLRS. Chassis, what chassis did the MLRS system? Uh, I similar think to? it was its own. It, wasn't, it okay. wasn't based on any of our tank or APC or IFV infantry fighting vehicle chassis that I'm aware of. I think it was its own, its own design. Now, when you say pod, how many missiles, and correct me if I'm wrong, are in a pod? So, good question. So, HIMARS has one pod, and that one pod can be loaded with either a unitary ATACMS missile, so one missile, or six rockets. Six rockets. So, your, the trade-offs there are your unitary missile carries a larger payload in one missile than any one rocket can, but more importantly than that, it has a much longer range. Ammunition the Ukrainians are likely to get their hands on, you're looking at, for an ATAC and unitary missile, 70 to 300 kilometers, which in American terms is between 43 and 183, 186 miles is what you're looking at for a unitary missile. That's how far it, that's how far you're going to shoot with a unitary. And is that, is that any attackums can fly that far, or is there like different categories of attackums? There are different categories, but the most common attackums, and again, the ones the Ukrainians are most likely to get their hands on, fall into that category. There are we we are fielding missiles with more extended range than that. I highly doubt they'll end up in Ukrainian hands before the war is over. But you're t- like so you're saying. 40 to 186 miles is the range that yeah like the 186 mile like you're you're playing you're you're playing with a little fire there not because of the uh, yeah you're hitting Ukrainians. Dallas from Houston to put it uh, yeah so if you hit Belgorod mm-hmm. with with one of those missiles you're risking some some not retaliation but an escalation in the conflict between the U.S. and Russia. Now, the good, the good news is they're unlikely to do that by accident um, because most of these munitions are GPS guided or GPS aided. At least they both have inertial onboard tracking systems and are aided by GPS satellite. Both the ATACMs and the Gimlers, the GPS guided multiple launch rockets, are are the other option. So the advantage of the multiple launch rockets are as you might guess, each one, you have six of them, you can hit a wider array of targets. I will say both ATACMS missiles and rockets can have either a unitary warhead, just a a single blast Mm. charge, or they can have uh, cluster Cluster. munitions as well. Both have that option. I.e. like like the the war crimes cluster (laughs) munition-ish. Again, not everything unpleasant is a war crime. Well, you know, I'm, you know what I'm saying? Like uh, cluster, cluster saying. munitions are like a note or like generally perceived to be a no-go. Right? Yeah. Well, you, I know when I was, when I was in Iraq, I, I never used DPICM, which is dual purpose improved cluster munitions because the release authority was with the president. So we have not disavowed the use of cluster munitions, but we're unlikely to use them. Is the it's, like, it's, it's, it's like, it's like Willie P. Right? Like we yeah. will use. Well, I, I I have used quite phosphorus, but um, uh, it's, it's yeah, like as illumination, it's fine. But like if there's people downrange, and like they catch on fire, and you know it's 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 bad, it's bad, it's bad. Like in fact, I think some some folks would consider it a chemical weapon. Now, I think if you use it on people, you could make that argument. But if you just use it as an illumination round, it's an illumination round. Well, right? uh, and obscuration is yeah. most like if, if we're going to fight Russia per se, I, I hope we don't, because I think the two foremost nuclear powers of the world should very much avoid fighting each other directly. Let's just keep doing this through proxies, please. 
if we were to fight a country with widespread thermal capability, you need white phosphorus in order to wash out their optics because of the heat. Using just old school hydrochloric HC smoke, while it is safe to walk through for for people, it doesn't actually, if your enemy has thermals, it doesn't do much. So you would like, in order for the, to achieve the obscuration effect, you would, would you detonate that at altitude or would you like detonate you right a, in front of a position? You know, if, <laughs> if, if they have, they have some fire starting in front of their position, that's just more confusion, isn't it? But okay, yeah, but you don't, but you don't aim it at the people. You can just like aim it in front of them. Generally Ish. speaking, but for obscuration fires, you would calculate a linear target close to the enemy's position, not necessarily with the intent to light them on fire, although I'm not going to cry about it if it happens. And then you would you would fire a height of burst. So you, you it wouldn't be a ground detonation white phosphorus round because that doesn't spread it very well. And in order for it to obscure thermals, it has to spread. So you would have you would calculate your height of burst above the ground to try to get the best the closest effect cloud that, to what you're intending. Obviously, winds change. You know, you're not going to get the exact figure you're looking for, but that that's how you would fire that mission. Is you would, you know. So so back to High Mars and MLRS. Yeah. So there's one pod on a High Mars. There's two pods on MLRS. Yes. Okay. Sir. Now going back to the rockets, the the Gimlers, those are the rockets. Mm-hmm. Attackums or Atackums, whatever, whatever it's called, yeah. um, is the is the un, un, unitary rocket or the, sorry, the mm-hmm. unitary missile. Yes. Uh, on the the Gimlers, if you were to use those, are they fired six at a time? Are they fired one at a time? Is it to choose, pick your poison? How does it work? You, I do believe you can pick your poison. You can expend one Gimler at a time if you want to, or you can fire them as a cluster. I generally think you're going to fire them as a cluster because immediately Mm -hmm. upon firing, you're going to want to move and you'll have time to reload at your next firing point because a rocket firing does send off a huge signal to the aforementioned counter-battery radar. And since, according to mixed reports, the Ukrainians have either six or 12 high Mars total, which equates to two batteries of rockets in our terms, of rocket launchers in our terms, they're going to want to keep those safe. Uh, I don't think that high Mars by themselves could turn the tide, but they are an incredibly useful artillery system and they can be decisive if used properly. Now, do they outrange most of the systems that the Russians have? Yes, though not the S-300 or you know, the, 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 the true intermediate range ballistic missile type systems that they're not, they're not longer range than that. And I don't remember the exact figure on the Russian artillery system, their IRBMs. I don't remember their exact range. I know it does exceed 300 kilometers though. So they do have things that can hit high Mars theoretically. And furthermore, they can also vector air onto high Mars from a radar hit. So they can send SU-25 or SU-24 Frogfoots, or they can send Heinz, or they can send something to go kill High Mars. And as we've talked about, High Mars is just a truck. It's very lightly armored. Uh, if you're if they're within firing range of a BMP, they're done. You know, like if they're within direct fire range of anything, they are not meant for direct engagement with the enemy. So they have to be, you know, they have to follow shoot and scoot. You know, they're, they're not like the, they're not they're not like the what the Shulkas or like the the ZS no. ZSUs. No, they're not Shorad. Yeah, they're they're not yeah, those, Ranger events. Yeah. By the by the way, those things are awesome. <laughs> they're pretty badass. Uh, I'm, I'm I mean, lying. only really only if you really kind of use them against ground targets, even though they're designed for air targets. But uh, yeah. Well, I mean, the German eighty-eight millimeter howitzer from World War II was originally anti-aircraft as well, but made its bones supporting ground assault. So. So it's it's a long tradition at this point. Now, in terms of ammunition, uh, like how quickly can they burn through this stuff? It sounds like it's more strategic targets or what these things are going to be used for because of the range. Uh, I mean, they can burn through it as quickly as they can reload and calculate should they know. Uh, that's actually one of the things about the reports that, that troubles me is they've talked about hitting ammunition depots and supply depots with their high Mars. And I'm not saying those aren't valid targets. They very much are. But 
given the scarcity of that asset, I would think you'd restrict them to either counter battery, annihilating Russian artillery, which rockets are very good for, or high value targets in terms of you know, command centers, you know, like you have, so on your ATACMs, you have a 500 pound warhead that's basically identical to an har a harpoon anti-ship missile. It's got very good penetrating properties. You know, you want to use these things where they're going to pack the most punch. Dep depriving Russians of ammunition is obviously a very worthwhile goal. I don't know that that's a proper allocation of assets, though. You unmask your rockets to destroy something that is a large threat to you, not something you could hit with any other weapon system. Now that again, I say that, given the troubles that the Russian army has had sustaining a combined arms offensive, maybe that changes the equation. Maybe it does become worthwhile to expend rare munitions on fuel or ammo, knowing that you're actually going to spoil an attack that would have launched successfully otherwise. So I don't want to be, you know, there are a lot of folks speaking very authoritatively when the information is at least somewhat jumbled. My gut tells me they're maybe not being as disciplined with their high marks as they should be, but I don't know that I'm not on the ground. I'm not, I'm not in their fire direction center. If I piece together the information that's out there, and again, I'm probably going to get this number wrong. But I think in the last few weeks, they've targeted something like 11 Russian or successfully targeted 11 Russian depots, arms depots and things like that. And given what's going on with the sanctions, I, I think it's I think it's a deliberate effort mm -hmm. to yep. just bleed them, bleed them dry. So right now, I think in the Donbass, the Russians had something like a five to one numerical advantage but they're just expending a lot of men and material in that fight if if i had to consider where they might strike next i think recently again i'm piecing together this stuff in real time so i could be completely wrong but there were like seven strikes of some sort outside or nearby kharkiv so it feels like the russians might be trying to resume some sort of a fight there because Luhansk is all but wrapped up. The Donbass, they're, they're working their way through it. But I think Shoigu was the one who kind of put something out that they need to dramatically escalate the conflict. Because I think what they're seeing is they only have a limited amount of time during summer. And then I think you get to the, the uh, I think in the fall, it does get pretty muddy again mm -hmm. and that's gonna that's gonna slow the, i think i know in the spring it does when you have the thaw but coming the into the yeah yeah the raspatitsa yeah and in but i don't know if it, it works the other way around but it gets cold i know that so we'll see we'll see what's yeah. happening but the feeling yeah. i get is that the russians had kind of i think i started this and i never finished it, it had three phases right so there's the thunder run we talked about then the second phase is Putin, who you got to give him credit for it, was like, this isn't working, pull out, and we're going to narrow our focus on the eastern and southern fronts. Because southern front had been going well. It's probably the best part. But that's in no small part to the terrain down there. It's like I, friends who have been there say that the Greeks had called it, that was where they believed Hades, or some Greeks believed Hades was back in the classical era. <laughs> era because it was so flat like it's so flat you can see for for miles which is great tank ground down there yeah so the second phase was kind of consolidate there and do a broad eastern push and obviously the ukrainians took back kharkiv so again the third phase was putin and company further constrained their attack to focus primarily on the donbass and that started to work and was having success. And now it's close to culminating, but at what cost? So my gut tells me that the Russians are going to try to expand further in the east. In the north, they're, they're still doing exercises and still have troops there. But I, don't, I think they're more of a, a ruse. It's just to mm -hmm. kind of keep Ukrainian forces fixed in the north to prevent 
a repeat, but yeah. I think they're smarter than uh, it's just bad tank terrain. Like they'll get they'll get they'll get they'll get slaughtered. And plus, they 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 never intended to take Kiev, right? The city's just too big. It would be a nightmare mm-hmm. trying to take it. So I think that's more of a kind of a fixing operation, and will yeah. continue to be a fixing operation. So anyway, it feels like it feels like it's the tides are starting to turn again partly fueled by the the use of the high mars systems but it, but to your point it's only two batteries at best right it's not going to turn yeah. the tide of the war however they are using them to affect and taking out all these arms depots and yeah. things like that yeah. so we'll see like we have what a month before this culmination point happens mm. oh i don't know what what say you how do you think this thing's going to play out I don't know. I think Russia, Russia's continuing adaptation of their tactics and their operations is troubling for the Ukrainians because they are learning. I know there was a lot of laughing and pointing at Russia in the early I've days. I've been of the saying war. this. I've been saying this exact yeah. point since day one. I've been saying yeah. this. The yeah. Russians always, excuse my language, like they're just a fucking mess at the beginning, but they always learn. They in World War II, they were an absolute like shit show in the very beginning because Stalin took out like uh, really good generals like Tukashevsky, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But they always learn. Always. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tukashevsky and his disciples had just as much of a grasp of what tanks and artillery and airplanes and radio communications. Deep battle. War as Guderian. Yep. Deep battle. Deep battle that, that became Blitzkrieg, which is such an overused term, which then became Airland Battle 2000, which we still kind of use when we're doing combined arms operations. Even though we have tried to retitle it, it's effectively the same thing. I, uh, I, and then and the way that we're supposed to fight is kind of the mission tactics, right? Off Trox yep. Tactic. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Now, do we? That's, that's, a, that's a subject for another video. We're supposed I to. I did. When I, was yeah. in, when I was in the Op 4, I was doing that all day long, man. Uh, all, in yeah. fact, I wrote an article about it in good old Armor Magazine way back in the day. Nice. nice. But, uh, so, but sorry, I, I didn't actually yeah. answer your question. I, I made a yeah, couple sorry. of... Pretend- I went I off on couple- like a random tangent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got me. You got me. You got me. Go ahead, I made sorry. a couple of pretentious points, <laughs> threw in some stuff from our military history, our shared love of military history, and got you distracted. But in answer to your question, I think the side will win who realizes how to maintain a combined arms offensive and use each piece of their symphony in its proper place. I'm not trying to downplay the impact of high bars. What I'm saying is that there's a propensity because it's easy to latch onto for people to look at a weapon system and be like, ah, this, this yeah. is our there's no silver bullet. Exactly. In the early days of the war, it was the javelin, right? Everything was about the javelin. And I'm not, again, I'm not downplaying the javelin. It's an important weapon system. I'm not downplaying the high Mars. It's an important weapon system, but it's how you operate all of your combat arms and your logistics and your various other support branches in concert and who can do that the best amongst the chaos of battle that's going to win. So far, both sides have had a hard time doing that. Ukraine has had perhaps a little bit of an advantage because they're on the defense. They don't have to achieve a positive aim. Well, now they do because they've lost territory. Well, they also also have the lesson of the last eight years where they instituted or have more of an NCO core, right? The Russians are just, I think that there was that recommendation and they never took it. And as a result, they're they're feeling it yeah, well and generating an nco core when you're not societally geared for it is a little tough at nco in western armies is a very fundamentally middle class job right i mean frankly so is junior officer for that matter we're not we're not aristocrats in any real sense of the word but so to have that competent middle management that frees up officers to have larger spans of control it's a very good idea if you can do it. I, I think we're right to have our army structured the way we have with our NCOs having so much leeway and authority and being titled appropriately the backbone of the army. Um, right. 
it is important to remember the like you said it's important to remember the russians don't have that now there are good armies that don't have that the israelis for example don't have a strong nco core because they everyone serves Mm -hmm. so but everyone also takes it seriously because they're defending their homeland so they're they have a little more leeway with their reservist reservist system and their reliance on officers than the Russians do. It's also why Russian units are smaller, uh, pound for pound. Russian tank platoons are three, where four, three infantry fighting vehicles, three BMPs versus three Bradleys, so on and so forth on up the chain. Because again, they their officers have to do almost all of the leading in the Russian army. Yeah, we actually did that too. Like we would go off and on for each rotation. So mm-hmm. I would be in charge of a motorized rifle company. So I would take, I would combine the armor guys and the infantry guys. And then mm-hmm. the infantry lieutenant would be kind of second fiddle that rotation. Then I would be second fiddle, fiddle the next rotation. Mm-hmm. But it was, I mean, it was a, a great experience to see how they actually fought, which is I, I also made it, it just insane watching like guys, you're, you're lined up nose to butt. Like what, what, like, what are you doing? Like, oh my God. You're not, you're not in herringbone awesome. formation. Like you're, you're, you're just stopped in a road. You don't go immediately go to herringbone formation. I'm like, yeah. did I just learn it wrong? Like, yeah. Right. I'm saying As like that because you, because you poisoned me before the call. You told me that you say like too much because you're in California and I never say like now I'm saying like constantly it's your fault. Anyway, sorry. Continue. <laughs> As an artillery officer watching the stalled columns of Russian tanks and bimps, I I was just, I'm like, I, battalion six, DPICM, linear target. Come on, guys, let's do this. Yeah, you're let's probably sal- you're salivating, right? I'm yeah. thinking A-10. Like, just call them the A-10s. Yeah, like, all of it. All of it. Hit him with all of it. Because, God, good God, I saw at least a regiment's worth of armored fighting vehicles of various types stalled on the road. I'm like, that regiment could evaporate in minutes if someone just you know i oh i my training even though i fought in iraq and afghanistan and my entire service was during the the global war on terror my entire training was still cold war so mm-hmm. all through west point and then officer basic course up until captain's career course captain's career course had been re-geared more towards iraq and afghanistan but my entire officer basic course was calling artillery on not Russian tank formations, Russian tank formations. And so to see that in real life, just waiting there for every indirect fire and aerial asset to smoke it, God, it was painful. Well, I got to use BM-21 rockets on, nice. uh, on M1 tanks. So yeah. that was... Yeah. That was which is uh, yeah, the OC I, throwing RD simulators in the middle of the <laughs> of the uh well, I, logger. So we did this thing. Have you ever heard of this Millennium Challenge exercise? It was before your time. So you graduated, you graduated, I want to say 2005 from West Point. Okay. Correct. I did my I did my research. You're from Susanville, California, right? Anyway. I did. I went to high school in Susanville, California. <laughs> Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Uh, where was I going with this? So there was there was an exercise in either 2000, 2001. It was called Millennium Challenge. And I think it was part of a broader exercise. There was like this retired Marine Corps General Van Riper or Van Ripper, Van Riper. Oh, like that. right. Right. Now this is coming back to me. Right. Yeah. Go ahead. I think it was tied into the same one because I read about that separately years later. Mm-hmm. But I think they like if they did it a component of it at the, at the national training center, I was definitely part of it. Mm-hmm. So what the U S military was checking out is, is millennium challenge. And I remember this cause I, because this general was the biggest fucking asshole I've ever seen in my entire life. General Laporte. And I'm going to say, I'm going to name it. Right. Because he was in charge of this on the U S side. He, he was like, cl- like running around yelling at soldiers claiming they were cheating this and that. And yeah, exactly. He's a f- fucking asshole. Anyway, excuse my language. <laughs> So in this particular exercise, I was, I was an XO at the time. So I was a CRP combat reconnaissance patrol guy. So I had a BRDM Burdum, right. Which is a Russian yep. visually modified on a Humvee basically. Yeah. But as part of this challenge, they were integrating this situational awareness system software where they have little icons on their screens and things like that. Blue force tracker. Yes. I think it was the first use of this blue force I, by the way, did, did they still use that by the time that you got to it? 
it eventually became a pretty decent system. Like okay, because when they uh, first rolled it out, like yeah. so. Yeah. What happened with this thing is all these tank crews would be focused on this blue force tacker, tracker inside their tanks. So literally, I used the Wadi system at, at mm -hmm. Fort Irwin, and I parked my Birdum like just on the edge of this Wadi. This you know, this, it's probably I don't know 10, 10 feet high. Mm -hmm. So I just parked my Birdum there. I got off. I, I had like one of those old school. Why am I not remembering? Garmin. Same Gars? Oh, a Garmin. A Garmin. Garmin. GPS. One of those yeah. old school Garmin GPS, like private, whatever. Yeah. So I got out. I walked into the middle of their assembly area. <laughs> like of, of a tank company, of an M1A2 Abrams and, tank and company. And you're in the you're in the enemy BDUs. Up for I walk to the back deck of one of these things. <laughs> And it, it must have been like four or five a.m., something like that. It wasn't. There was still day. There was there was like daylight, but there wasn't a lot of daylight. Yeah, it's not. And I'm like, like yeah. I'm like, holy shit! I can get. I, I think at the time they had eight digit grid coordinates. I had the eight digit grid coordinate. I went back to my Birdum, and I <laughs> I called higher. I'm like, hey. Uh, request BM twenty one rockets, and they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I. Uh, I was like, I have a, an eight digit grid for a tank company. And they're like, well, how do you know? How are you sure? I'm like, yeah, I kind of walked to the back deck of a, a, and they're like, up, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like cleared fire BM 20. I'm like, just give me a second to get out of here. And I destroyed a tank company. <laughs> so, so of course this general's pissed off because this thing's not, but that's the whole point. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to test this stuff so that they're, yeah. we got the kinks. Now, was it the technology that was the failure? No, it was the TTPs that these guys, and it was probably, it wasn't even formalized. They're just focused on their screens, just like people are focused on their screens today. And they just lost their situational awareness of what was going on. You're absolutely so, right. The, the BFT turned into a pretty decent system because we realized by the time we were using it in Iraq, we realized its limitations and what it was good for and what it wasn't good for. It was not, the, there was, because I remember reading about and hearing about the fielding of the blue force tracker and it, it, the, the other iteration of it was the FBCB2 future battle command something. I don't remember. That, that sounds familiar though. That, that, that acronym. Basically they were the same. They were, they're basically the same kind of system. One was a little more advanced, had different features, it's Android and iPhone, whatever. So we realized the limitations of it. It was not what I think some senior officers expected it to be, which was a digital turn battle command into command and conquer system that gave you real time locations on everything and would allow. And by you command to use... and conquer, you you literally mean the video game command and conquer. I mean the video game. I think some battlefield, some senior officers expected to be able to move their people around like chess pieces. And that's just never the way war works. I, I like wargaming, both tabletop and when I get a chance to in video games. But the limitations, and, and some war games do try to model this, to be fair, but your people aren't pieces. They get scared, they get tired, they get hungry, they forget where they are. They navigate to the wrong point on the map, even with GPS. You know, so I think the Blue Force Tracker started out as an attempt to eliminate that kind of uncertainty and once we realized that was not possible we were then able to use it for what it was good for which was an extra communications platform and it was a situational awareness tool right with, with heavy caveats it's very similar function with artillery data systems uh, the advanced field artillery tactical data system has so many settings like if you were to do everything it's programmed to do it's it's fucking skynet you know, like it could be, you can program it to where you just type in a target description and a location and it decides what it's going to hit it with and assigns the proper fire asset to that target. But the odds of having that all programmed correctly and getting the result you want are minuscule. So you delete all that shit and you put in just what you need, you know, right. and you make sure you don't have some weird restriction hiding in a database that won't let you fire your fucking mission when you see that company of tanks and you can hit them 
uh, and it's very exciting for us artillery types. So, so yeah, it's just, you've got to realize the, the limitations of your system and that they're never going to be as effective as what that contractor sold to Congress. It's never going to live up to everything the, that Lockheed or Raytheon or whoever said it was going to do. It might still be useful. It's just not going to be that useful. That's the crazy thing about this war, though. Like all this stuff that came out 20 years ago, 20 years ago that you're seeing in real time in this war. Like I was involved in the testing of it. We were testing javelins against a Russian threat and I was the Russian threat. And I was, you know, we developed tactics on the Russian, quote unquote, Russian op force side that, you know, where we could get around some of this stuff. And the Russians are learning it in real time. Now, to be fair, the Russians didn't have the benefit of operating in a desert, right, where I did, right? They, they operated yeah. in the worst possible terrain, which was these forests in northern Ukraine, not, not great. And tiger. urban areas, too. Yeah. And their equipment broke down a lot more than my broke ass Sheridans, which you, know. <laughs> you were Sheridan Bismods. Oh yeah, yeah, old yeah, nice. old school. Yeah, yeah very so nice. probably the last Sheridans in the U.S. Army. You're just keeping those alive. <laughs> uh, I think they use one of my platoons was like they had some like special engine program. It's the souped up engines that they. So I was like the test bed for. Anyway, a long, nice. long time ago. Wasn't anyway, the last yeah. line units of Sheridans the 82nd used to have a battalion of Sheridans at some Probably. point that they were they were going to throw out the back of of C17s yeah, that, or something. Yeah, yeah. That's, what that's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed they're, they're like airborne tanks. So what's the <laughs> Russian equivalent? Uh, Big Mama Drop uh, BMDs, but they're not tanks. BMDs, they're yeah. Big Mama yeah, Drop. Yeah, but the Russians. That's I remember. I, it's apocryphal. Maybe you know the truth better than I do, but I heard the the initial tests of Russian airborne AFVs ended up they with... They put people in them. They put people in they them. They put people in them. And then one of the comments was, we need to breed stronger men because they ended up with sacks of broken bones. So one of the first impulses the Soviet general staff had was, well, let's just breed stronger men who can survive the drop. It's like, oh, oh boy. God. You're well, I mean, the same thing. The same seriously. thing. Seriously. <laughs> well, the same thing happened this time. It's like those poor. I mean, like, look, I feel bad for it. like the VDV. Like they got, they got slaughtered on their uh, what a Lucian seventy six air like transport aircraft before they even had a chance to deploy. I mean, that's listen, guys. I I am not besmirching the courage of paratroopers one little bit, but you got to be a moron to realize to not realize that if you have another option besides MASTAC airborne you should take it. There are, there are situations where that is the answer because that's your best option out of bad options. But if you but the can, US rarely does that, right? They use, usually do helleborne assaults, right? Yeah, we, we, use, we use air assault. We move by helicopter and we will parachute in small elements, reconnaissance elements, special operations. Right. But the jumps that have actually happened that have given people mustard stains well, I've heard mixed reports, you know, about whether they were a good idea, whether they were necessary, so on and so forth. So, yeah, was Normandy a good idea? I mean, it was it the, was a necessary one, I think. Uh, when but they got slaughtered. It. They, I mean, well, actually, yeah. the, the only worse decision was probably the glider. The gliders yeah. they sent in there. The glider was, sucked. The point is, the airborne did their job in Normandy by causing confusion in the middle echelons of the German forces because they were such highly trained small units that they were able to continue the mission despite, you know, extreme disorganization and chaos as a result of airborne. Again, necessary and a glorious part of their history. I wouldn't deny that for a moment. God knows they deserve every ounce of it. I'm just saying if you had a better option, you should take it. <laughs> like yeah. If you have something that positions your forces in a more orderly manner, that is available to you, you should do that instead, if you can. Okay, so veering us back to Sorry. the topic at hand. <laughs> I can I can um, tangent about military history all day long. Well, I, 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 I let you and I started tangenting too. So yeah. wh where are we going to be in the next three months? Man, I don't know if we'll even have reached, like, I... I I give even odds the war is still ongoing in three months. Oh, I 
I hundred. I wouldn't even give even odds. I'd say it's it's ninety nine percent. And I wouldn't be shocked if the lines haven't shifted that much because I, from what I can read, the Russians are learning and adapting. We are throwing a lot of good material and apparently enough training to make the Russian the Ukrainians effective with what we're giving them, but. I don't see a unified strategy for the Ukrainians that's going to allow them to expel the Russians. They'll be lucky to halt Russian offensives as they occur. But again, like you said, Russians are just expending tons of men and materiel. And while they have large reserves of both, they don't have an unlimited supply of either, nor do they have an unlimited well of will, political will. Well, also um, the demo, the demographic. Uh, I don't know what, what it's what it's called, but if you look at like men of uh, military age, it's it's like you know a kind of a narrow hourglass, and they're at the hourglass part. So they're going to yeah. run out of men of military age very quickly. And they're going to have to expand the the age. The other thing that they're doing, which is really really twisted, is they're just taking men out of like Donbass and some of the occupied Ukrainian territory, like literally just grabbing them off the street and sending them to the front. Yep. So they're having Ukrainians kill Ukrainians. So it's just, it's a very Russian solution to these problems, but it's an effective solution. And they're Unless they turn around and start shooting at you. Yeah. And they're accepting volunteers largely from non-European enclaves in Russia. Putin is trying to avoid dipping too deeply into the well of European Russian military age men. Say what you want about our civilization and our ethnic tensions. Russia is openly racist with its policies, very openly racist with its policies towards its ethnic minorities. And to a degree, I don't think most Americans could grasp. Furthermore, that's something people tend to ignore as a potential motivation for Putin is not only the grain and the natural gas and all the other resources Ukrainian the Ukrainians have, but also just reabsorbing a bunch of European Slavs into the Russian Empire because Russia has experienced, like you just pointed out, a population implosion. They need more people as well as more resources. So, even even uh, that's the other thing too. It's the largest country on the planet because of the, like in terms of land area yeah. and. Putin passed the law of the like, uh, far, like, what is it? The law of the hectare, the far, f- like far Eastern hectare, something like that, where it's very similar to the U S homestead act, where if you go to the Russian far yeah. East, they will give you land and this and that. And that population there is still declining at the same time. If you look across the border in China, that population is 16 times what it is on the Russian side of the border. So, yeah, you know, there's, there's anyway, that's, that's kind of more a longer term thing. Here's where I think things are going to, they're going to go. I, I think they're, they're going to continue the slog in Donbass. I think you'll see Ukrainian counteroffensive from the North into Kyrgyzstan. I think the, the Russians are having trouble holding it because any place that, is behind Russian lines. Oh, that, that's the other report I read. Oh my God. So in Mariupol, there are so many bodies that the water is contaminated. Mm-hmm. People are getting uh, cholera and what's the other one that they always get? You'll know dysentery. Typhus. Dysentery. Or dysentery, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's so bad. And the Russians just, it's not that they're sloppy, they just don't have the resources to to deal with all this stuff. Yeah. So it is, it has become a hellscape and it'll continue to be that way for, for a while. But I, anyway, I think they'll kind of have some limited successes there. I think you'll see a broadened offensive in the East. Uh, primary target will be Kharkiv. Mm-hmm. And then I think the, the Russians are going to, they're playing the grain game now. They're saying, look, we can, we can, we can ship this grain out. We can do this, this stuff. And they're going to start starving Ukraine on the vine. The other thing they're going to do is they're going to shut down the, or I don't know if they'll shut it down, but they're going to continue to play footsie with the Germans. And the Germans have not adequately prepared for what's coming, even though it was 
completely obvious. The German chief of staff in the opening days of the war said, my army can do nothing. Like, publicly. Like, publicly, he said his army can do nothing. I mean, can you imagine the outcry? Like, I mean, it's insane to me, as dishonest as senior officers can be sometimes, for one of them to frankly admit that his army is helpless. It doesn't shock me that it is. It shocks me that he admitted it. I worked with, there were a lot of great people I worked with in the armies of various allies when I was in Germany and when I was in Afghanistan, because we were working with Italian, Spanish, some French, some German. Well, the Germans are generally very good. people, but their militaries were, yeah, they, they they're were. Not, they're, not, they're not pretty capable? <laughs> really? They're, they're, dude, I grew up with World War II movies, so I was expecting, you know, the, the the grandchildren of the people who fought to the bitter end against the Soviet Union and the United States and Great Britain. You're, ex- at the same you're expecting time. Z- the Germans? <laughs> yeah, I was expecting the Germans. Z- the Germans? That is, that is not what most of them are like anymore. It's just not, they, they really have lost, as a culture, they seem to have lost all appetite for war, which I get it, no one wants war really. But their complete abandonment of warrior culture is biting Europe in the ass. The rich countries of NATO, and I'm not, I'm not holding Poland responsible for having as large and capable of an army as a country with the GDP of Germany. Because a lot of folks will counter argue like, oh, what do you care? Like, does Poland and the Czech Republic have to have, you know? And I'm like, no, guys, I'm talking about countries that have the economy to fund a non-trivial military. Right. But instead, they spend it on luxuries. And then when, then they turn up their nose at capitalist economies like the United States when they're on defense welfare with us. I'm not, not, not voicing an opinion on socialized medicine and socialized education one way or another. I'm just saying. They can they pay were, for that because they didn't have to they, pay for their own defense, basically. Full exactly. And, right. and, and now Ukraine's paying the price for that because NATO was no longer. Putin calculated correctly that we would not directly intervene in an invasion of, an invasion of Ukraine. He was right. And I'm not saying we should have, to be clear. Like, I'm not saying we should have responded by putting the first armored division into Ukraine, because again, I think it's very important for us not to fight the Russians directly. I still hope the Russians lose. I'm all down for helping Ukraine win. But the fact is, it would have been better if Putin had some doubt in his mind about what would happen, what would happen if he crossed the border. He did not. So he did. And largely that's because we, our own situation is so divided and our own leadership has been so indecisive for two generations now. And if we're not there and committed, I mean, the Brits will fight, but they're tiny in terms of what kind of force they can feel. They're high quality troops, very high quality troops, but there just aren't that many of them. The Germans have abrogated. The French have some good troops too, but they've also have the problem of keeping them in the field, keeping them supplied, and having the political will to use them. And that what dates about all the, the way Swedes, back to Algeria. What about the Swedes and the Finns who were not part of NATO, but now, like the Swedes are? I mean, again, I have no experience. I'm assuming they're pretty good because they had to defend themselves anyway. Yeah, I have no idea about the Swedish forces. I know the Finnish. I mean. I'm going to be honest, most of what I know about Finland is from the, the, the Finno- war. Soviet war, the Winter War, right. which ha- has my, the, the Finns have won my eternal admiration <laughs> for that. So I imagine they're still pretty hardcore. Yeah, we'll see. People All right, who live well, in a cold environment like that kind of have to be tough. <laughs> yeah, especially, but I mean, Russia kind of, I don't know about if they doubled their border, I don't know what the exact, I think they added another 800 miles to their border by being, you know, just menacing those two. I mean, they, like, the Russians flew two nuclear armed Su 24s over Gotland, like over Swedish territory. Like, how, how, how irresponsible is that? I mean, like, 
Russians, Russians, Russians going to Russians, right? So <laughs> anyway, it was a pleasure, my friend. And I look forward to talking to you on a completely separate topic on the next episode. See you soon. Excellent. Thanks for having me, Sean. If you enjoyed this video, hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.